Awesome. Joining me today on the Uniweb interview show, Joseph Melesh, author of White or Black, Ray? Absolutely. <laughs> Joseph, man, thanks so much for coming on, uh, joining me from Toronto, Canada. How's it going, brother? Not too bad. It's a beautiful sunny day today. Uh, it, des- it decided to stop raining. Uh, yeah. So we're enjoying a little bit of sunshine today, and apparently tonight it's supposed to rain again. Hey, well, we were talking a little bit about this before the I uh, started recording. Uh, can't have the rainbows without the without the rain, right? Absolutely. April April showers they say bring May flowers, and I guess uh, May showers are going to bring I don't know maybe June or July flowers. Maybe they bring lobster. Who knows? <laughs> this could be true too. Lobster, you know, lobsters are good too. Lobsters are good. So, Joseph, thanks for coming on, man. I, I'm excited to talk to you about your book. Uh, how, when did you publish uh, White or Black, Gray? And I'm interested in the name well, as well. I have a lot of questions for you about this book. Uh, White or Black, Gray was published in late 2018. Uh, okay. st- uh, started writing it many years ago, and it's a debut first in, a, in the series from the files of the BAU. What is the BAU? Uh, BAU stands for the Behavioral Analysis Unit of okay. the FBI. Uh, uh, if you like to show criminal minds, yeah, uh, basically the BAU, the crim- the show Criminal Minds follows the team from the BAU. And one of my favorite TV shows is Criminal Minds, and that kind of inspired me to write this book. So this book is a psychological suspense thriller. It- a psychological thriller with a pretty creepy uh, villain, uh, my on the sub. Everybody that has read the book so far has said when they finally hit the reveal, uh, their eyes bugged out. Yeah, oh, that's a good thing. That is a good thing, man. You wanna you wanna build that kind of suspense. That's fantastic. So, and this is this is the very first book you've published, right? That's correct. So, how long have you been writing for? I've been writing all of my life. Um, when I was, oh man, in grade eight, my English teacher said, I need to write for a living. I hated her. Um, <laughs> and I hated English. I failed English twice. Um, a hard but, language. Uh, it's, it's, it's a crazy language. I, yeah. I really, anybody that takes it as a set, like tries to learn English as an adult for a yeah. second language, my hat's off to them. Because I started, I learned English when I was like a kid, and I'm still struggling with it sometimes. It's just, Same here, it, man. There's, there's no rules. It's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> a bunch of crazy people came up with it, for sure. Um, so you, you've been writing your whole life. What happened a year ago, and you decided to publish this book? Well, it's... Or let me ask how this come about. When you're, when you're juggling full-time job, Raising a family, you know, there's a lot of things you put on hold. Yeah. And I started writing White or Black Gray about eight years ago. Went through a first, I had a couple of beta readers read it because I had no faith in myself. I had, I knew the story was good, but when you're starting something you knew you have, you know, artists have no faith in themselves. Correct. So I had a, a, a group of beta readers read it and everybody came back and said this is life changing like when Mm -hmm. are you going to put this out and went through draft after draft after draft um professionally edited and finally said to myself you know what it's time i'm ready to do it basically as an artist when you put your artwork out there it's kind of like taking your kid to kindergarten on the first day (laughs) and you're hoping all the rest of the kids will be nice to them. Right. Um, And I know not everybody's going to like my work, but you know what? So far, uh, the reviews and the the comments have been phenomenal and uh, I'm happy with that. What was it like having to revise it for eight years? Having to go back and draft after draft? Because that is something I I know we all deal with that Uh, doubt. As writers, the writing and the editing at the time, you're like, why am I doing this? Is like, it, it gets almost to a point where you kind of, you you have to. How do I put this? <laughs> the editing process is great, 
the writing process is fun because that's what writers do. Yeah. But the publishing, that part is the nightmare from hell. Yeah. Uh, um, because there you've got your work. It's ready to go. It's ready to go to school for its first day, but right. you want to make sure you send it to school with all, you know, make sure you've got you know, a snack in your lunch box. Uh, make sure, you know, you may have a clean pair of underwear in case something goes right. wrong. <laughs> you never uh, know. Publishing is very difficult. And as a self publisher and doing something for the first time, um, all you can do is have faith in yourself that, yeah, you're going to make mistakes, mm. um, but you just have to, you put it out there and see yeah. what the universe says to it. So you had, you had a long period from the time this story was uh, born eight years ago to actual published date. Um, that's incredible that you were able to, you know, go that long from having somebody say, hey, this is amazing. You need to put this out there. What were so were you getting feedback that said I need to redo this chapter? Like, is the story that you wrote eight years ago the same story that we're getting now? Absolutely or, not. No, it's, it's totally different. The, sto the, the story <laughs> actually came to me in a dream. Um, yeah. One night, you know, you're asleep, you're dreaming, and the the uh, the unsub, which is the villain, the unknown sure. subject. My villain came to me in a dream what he was going to do to his victims. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I always sleep with a pad of paper beside my bed just in case something happens. And I wrote down an idea. Then I did the first draft. I had an editor read it. And this editor was also um, his, his favorite genre of books were police procedurals, uh, and suspense thrillers. So this was right up his alley. And I said, right. I need the honest opinion. Is this worth me investing time in? Took him a couple of weeks to read it. And he called me one day and said, Steve, this is, uh, he said, Joe, this is just, it's amazing. But yeah. you need, we need to do some stuff with it. The original manuscript, uh, Man, it was about 275 pages. Mm -hmm. The finished manuscript was over 480 pages. Uh, Holy what crap. actually, <laughs> I had no idea who the protagonist was going to be. I had no idea who the antagonist was going to well, I knew what the villain was going to do to his yeah. victims, but I didn't know who that villain was. I don't plot my my stories i don't outline i'm what apparently everybody calls uh, a pantser yeah. because i fly by the sea in my pants right um and at a certain point in manuscripts i do have to do some point form notes so i can remember what the heck is going on because my stories yeah, are very uh intense and fairly complex okay is it <clears throat> so this being a uh crime thriller, psychological thriller, was there any kind of research that went into actually writing the, the script or the, the book? Absolutely. Um, had to research. I, without giving up too much about the, the actual story itself, I had to research where in North America what this unsub was going to be doing to his victims. Mm. Uh, I need a location. Yeah. Um, a lot of of the stuff that takes place and happens to the victims. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of medical research uh, and also research on the FBI and the BAU. Yeah. Um, but an awful lot into the actual setting of where it took place. Right. I think that's uh, when you talk about the uh, research into the FBI and BAU, I think that's one of the most important factors in terms of if I'm reading a story, like wanting to build that realistic idea of their approach about going about things. Like, did exactly. you, I mean, how did you go about finding that out? Were you just researching um, articles on FBI procedurals or like, was it very I boring research? Love, one of my, one of, one of my favorite things is Google. Um, okay. I say to my daughter all the time, it's like, you know, 
when I grew up, we didn't have Google. You know, we had to, you know, go down to the library. We had to uh, go to the reference library. The Dewey um, Decimal System. Nowadays, we've got the entire world in the palm of our hands. Yeah. And so uh, Wikipedia, uh, Google, I've got uh, several friends that are in uh, the police um, uh, police industry. And a uh, few interviews I've asked a few. Uh, my, the main thing was I've been following FBI shows. I'm a crime thriller junkie. Right. Um, Law and Order, SVU, um, Criminal Minds, Dexter. Yeah. Um, it's just, uh, you know, I research, um, life is my research. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think we, we build the worlds. I mean, in writing fiction, we build the worlds that we see and that we love, right? And also Absolutely. that we, we hope to to bring to other people. Was this something that, when you talk about being a pantser, I know when I'm writing a story, I can get kind of ADD. If if it gets starts getting boring, I throw some stuff in there. Were you, like, writing in that same? <laughs> That's kind of how I do it. I, I don't know if, you, if you, you were like that at all. Is that why it got to be 480 uh, pages because you were like, let's throw this in there. This is exciting. Let's throw this in there. This is exciting. Like, how did that happen? The th the, with, with this, with, with white or black, um, it is very suspenseful. How do I, it's, that's, it's very cerebral. Um, now with that said, I've had several readers say they couldn't put it down because the, the action just they were they their hands were just glued to the page and they wanted to know what was going on. Yeah. Um, but it's not a gory shoot 'em up kind of crime story. Sure. Um, this is when when I would I like building tension in certain books that this one in particular by as the reader reading each page they get to a point in the page that they think that they're gonna there's gonna be a reveal yeah but i'm in control right. i'm not you're, you're not gonna find this shit out right away you right. gotta turn a page here um but the other thing a lot of people also notice when they read my book i love short chapters yeah uh, um, two or three four pages five at the max because we our time is so precious anymore. And yeah. some of these books I have read, you know, where you've got a, a, an author who has a 30 page chapter. Yeah. It's insane. I'm sorry. Too much. I, you look at the average person who's going to read a book nowadays, they're commuting to work. Maybe they're on the train, they're on the subway. So they've got their e reader. They don't have time to read 30 pages. Right. Two or three. If you've got a chapter that's two or three chapters long, before you know it, you're a hundred pages into a book, right? Yeah. Right. So when I'm planning in my head the page or the chapter that I'm writing, I want each chapter to have that uh, we were talking about the valley and then the peak. Yeah. And then maybe throw a cloud in as they're getting up toward the peak and they're like, oh man, what's going on here? Yeah. And I've had a couple of readers message me they're like half of the fun of your book was trying to figure out what, what the heck was actually going on yeah see that i feel like that's such an art form though is leading somebody down what seems to be a straight path towards the target and then they get to the thing that's like this is the target i swear to god it's the target and then it's just poof, not the target yeah. at all i have no oh. clue how to i don't have no clue how to do that <laughs> at yeah. least I don't feel like I do. How do you? I mean, it is an art form. I, I believe it's a true art form of writing. What are? I mean, do you, are there certain things that you do, or you've learned how to, like, pull somebody down that path and then be like, "There's nothing here." <laughs> Visualization. Yeah, I'm one. Th I'm not normal. I've not, I've I come to this conclusion years and years and years ago. Um, I. <laughs> regularly talk to myself mm -hmm. um and i i love the my muse is this really loud voice in my head that has directed me throughout my life and i find that when you're if 
you listen to when as a writer as you're one of the worst things we can do as writers is when we're writing we stop writing to try and yeah. think about what we're about to write yeah, don't yeah, yeah. do that yeah. just type the freaking keys or use your exercise your wrist with your pen on the paper right. keep writing our job as writers is to write our editors turn all of that awesomeness into greatness yeah. you know and it's like as you're as you're trying to figure out how to draw um suspense susp what what scares you what intrigues you keep thinking this to yourself what mm -hmm. what brings the hair up on the back of your neck so as you're maybe writing dialogue you've got uh you know maybe the one of there's a, a uh one one of the one of your characters is walking down a hallway and you know she just gets home from work it's been a long day she just wants to have a glass of wine maybe have a snack so she goes to go to the kitchen but she doesn't remember seeing that uh, that that glass on, on the table where'd that come from and then as you're thinking in your head ooh, maybe there's a knife you know and then did i leave that light on yeah start building and suspicion then, you know start writing you know the hairs on the back of her neck start to go up so you have to put yourself in your character's shoes as you're mm -hmm. writing their story because yeah. all we really are is just the voice of the characters on the pages of our books yeah wow that's interesting um and it's a great way to put it too because i feel like whenever i've i've written I've only been able to do it literally in a straight line. And I, I jump from, I use third person in that way. So instead of giving the reveal, I jump to another character and what they're doing in that same moment. So there's a break in between. So the person's like, well, son of a bitch, I need to figure out what's going on with this person. So they go, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. That's, that's kind of how I've done it in writing. But that's like you said, using the visualization is a great tool. Um, and asking yourself that question. I, I forget that sometimes. Like, oh, I'm trying to answer a question here. I'm the, the reader is trying to figure something out here. Keep that in mind and just keep writing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like we, if you, if you focus, I always picture myself as like I'm at the computer and I'm, I'm writing my chapter. I try and visualize the character's and that scene right in front of me as I'm writing. And I'm just basically, I'm not even really writing. Mm -hmm. I am just watching what's going on. And my hands yeah. just happen to be uh, transcribing what they've done. Yeah. You become the witness. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'm a witness to their greatness. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> That's a great way to write. And I, f I feel like when you just continue to write too, and like living as a pantser, I think that's where a lot of the magic of writing comes in because I'll write something sometimes and I'll be like, I have no clue how this is going to resolve itself. But somehow like it'll, it'll tie back around to something that was earlier in the story and you'll be like, Oh, <laughs> like you blow your own mind in a way. Right. Like after about the second rewrite of, of white or black gray, um, and the title, oh my God, the, my title changed three times. Yeah. Um, I didn't even know what I was going to call the thing. Was it red, green, about, purple, or blue? Or <laughs> oh, I didn't know what I was going to call it until about six months before I, I hired a cover team, a, a graphic artist to do the cover and do the interior formatting. Um, mm -hmm. It went through three name changes, um, but that's, that's my style. It's... The, the story the, the story had to be told and yeah. i just had to freaking type the thing yeah it was going to come out regardless it was exactly. like a a big block of of uh, marble right and you were just chiseling away at it i exactly i i i'm you're right that's exactly right i'm sculpting my muse is my muse is telling me what to say yeah and all i've got to do is just listen to her so with that too, um, are you do you are you somebody who sits down and writes every day, or is this something that when you feel the passion to write, you do it? Uh, 
with me, it is all about the passion. Um, yeah. so I, I would love to have the ability to sit down every day and write. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I don't have that time sometimes, but at this, at, I also believe if we force ourselves to produce art for mm -hmm. art, like it would just, we're diluting the quality. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that a lot of artists and writers that that horrible word writer's block there's no such thing as writer's block right you know if you if you fit as long as your fingers haven't fallen off and you still got toes you're just going to have to learn how to maybe type with your toes or, <laughs> you know whatever voice to the text. only right. the only writer's block out there is yourself you know okay. it's just and with with me i didn't want i when you hit those periods where um oh, am I just doing this to just churn a page out? Yeah. That's wrong. You should, your, you, your, your muse should be saying to you, you need to write today or I'm not going to be nice to you, you know? Right. And yeah. that, that uh, I write when the spirit moves me. Um, but no, I would love to write every day. But unfortunately, I find that if, if I do, uh it's it dilutes what's what's coming out yeah i i totally agree with the the whole writer's block sentiment too because i and i talk about this a lot i feel like it's either it's not writer's block it's either i'm willing or unwilling to put something on the paper am i willing to accept what it is right it's just like sometimes it feels like absolute garbage and some but mm -hmm. there's still there, there's always something here because i when has it when has anybody on earth gone you know more more than 30 seconds without thoughts running through their head it just doesn't happen it's not no. possible it doesn't happen no. you know unless you're some sort of like buddha or whatever <laughs> it just doesn't happen I, <laughs> well one, one thing i am very guilty of is i will as i'm writing i will that wonderful my 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 friend that i hate i hate to love and love to hate is the backspace key oh yeah and I will sometimes. Da, 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 oops, we're gonna change that. And I don't. I don't mind doing the self editing because I actually say to myself, I'm not really self editing. My muse just told me backspace a few because that word's wrong. Yeah. And then we'll go on, and then and the editor can do his magic. Um, so writers shouldn't feel guilty when they do the self editing as they're going along. Absolutely not. And I, I think we get caught up to, and I, at least I'll speak for myself, I know I do, and what I'm writing has to always be shared with the world. Everything I write down doesn't have to be shared with the world. You know what I mean? Like, there's there are times I can write stuff that is absolutely and only for me, and it can be yep. the worst stuff to ever cross a human's mind, and that is perfectly okay. It's still writing, and it's still getting things out which i think is necessary for getting back to that muse who wants to speak i think we're just listening to all these voices in our heads you know and sometimes Absolutely. that shithead wants to talk a little bit louder than the muse <laughs> okay i i relate 100 percent that because like this is a, this is a series that i'm writing right now and i i still my 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 mind says it's a five book series mm -hmm. it may be less it may be more but as a series, and, and the reason I'm getting to this is I look at a series as you have a huge story that you just can't put in one book. Right. So you have a series of volumes that make up this greater work. There are two typos that even after edits and edits and edits and word for word proofreading, there were two typos in this book in white or black gray that made it past all of that. And I'm like, oh, my God, after all of that, two stupid English words <laughs> yeah. made it through all of that. So what I've done in the second book, you find a reason why there's a typo. And I'm like, <laughs> as I was writing the second Genius. book, I'm like, oh, my God, this is because I was so annoyed. When I was reading through the white or black, I'm like, "How the hell did we miss this?" Yeah. I'm paying, I'm paying editors to do this, and I was yeah. proofreading it. I had 
so many people, and you miss becoming? Like, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, oh, this is, no, the books are already, up. The, the, the printing, people have got them. My life is over. Yeah. Uh, this is horrible. <laughs> but then I thought to myself, ooh, there's a way to tr solve this. And it's solved in the second book. And, it's a, and when I came to that, um, epiphany or whatever you want to call it. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully the fans, like you look at shows like Walking Dead and you've got these super fans that know more about the show than the writers and the creators do. Right. I'm hoping I'll be blessed with some super fans that actually pay attention to the, the writing and will yeah. find us and wow, how he solved that spelling error is amazing yeah and that, that is that is incredible that you've done that i would have to go to uh, extreme lengths to solve my grammar grammatical errors <laughs> in my book and again it was one of those uh, because I'm, i have this fly by the seat of your pants nature yeah and it i trust me uh, the i must have turned every shade of red possible when i read that page and saw becoming spelt wrong i'm like oh yeah. my it, that's it it's over my career is over my before it's over. even started here uh, this is not becoming good and then yeah how, how <laughs> my muse told me to solve it i'm like this is great and it's you know what's uh and i've read multiple books on writing and i i believe it was um writing fearlessly by kevin canoa who said all we have to do is ask the question of our imagination and allow the answer to appear. Like the if if we if we ask any question, we'll come up with an answer. Our, our imagination is ready to come up with an answer. And it's like just be willing to ask the question. And it seems like it, that's what happened for you. Absolutely. Which exactly. is mind blowing. The, the one one of the things we have to always remember as writers is this is our world that we're creating. Yeah. So we can do whatever the heck we want to do here. Right. Yeah, we're you know, we're goofing it, around here. It's just, this is you know, <laughs> it, it, one 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 friend said to me a long time ago, especially in murder mysteries or where where there's death involved, sometimes a guy has to walk into the room with a gun. You right. know, <laughs> if, if, yeah. if you want to amp up the suspense, ooh, guy in you know, guy walks into the room with a knife and it's got right. blood dripping off it. Yeah, if you want the if you want the world to be in jeopardy, sometimes you got to blow up the world. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so you're writing book 2 right now. Yeah, book 2 Zara is in uh, the late stages of the first draft. I was hoping okay. to have it out this year, but that's not it's probably going to be out in uh, Q1 or Q2 of next year. Okay. Um and uh it's it's an it's it it is the total opposite of white or black gray. White or black gray is a very cerebral um, suspense thriller. And Zara is um, diehard meets Dexter nice. meets Criminal Minds. Uh, and maybe there's a little bit of Arnold Schwarzenegger thrown in there as well. I love, I love, Arnold! That my cookies. That's God, awesome. my hand. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. How is it, but it's it set it all in the same universe. Yeah. the same same world. Yes. Is it the same main characters? It's the same it's the same group of profilers from the FBI. They've okay. just gone on to another case. Okay. Cool. And this and that this case in particular involves um espionage, terrorism, and uh some hate mongering. Hey, there you go. <laughs> and that's Potentially uh, quarter one of next year. Yeah, uh, quarter one, quarter two of next year, probably. Okay. Um, I do want to ask you this too because we've talked about it before we started recording as well. Uh, on Twitter, you have two accounts on there: um, yeah. writing suspense and also Uncle Joe GTA. Uncle Joe GTA. Yeah, and you you have a ton of followers on each account. A lot on on uh, writing suspense or suspense writer. Suspense um, writer. How how have you seen a correlation in terms of the amount of people you have following you, your interaction with them, and then also the amount of like book sales um, for your novel? Or have you had to do a lot of personal like 
hitting the streets, getting out there, doing work to sell? It's it's been a learning process. Um, yeah. I've unfortunately not been able to market white or black gray as as much as I had hoped. I original the original plan was to release it in the fall of last year, but that you know, timing just did not work out. Um, and we're just now in the process of really amping up the marketing. Like for example, having a wonderful opportunity to have an interview of, uh, with yourself um, and get the word out there. Um, my daily Twitter account is Uncle Joe GTA, where I talk about my battles with depression and overcoming bullying through high school. And just the daily pump up my friends, uh, let's greet the day and make the most of it. Yeah. Uh, I try and be positive and I also tell it like is it like it is. I have no filter. Yeah. And uh, you know, if I think you're an idiot, I'm going to tell you that you're an idiot. Um, yeah. And if I think that you know what, you aren't getting the recognition that you need, I'm going to give you the recognition because that's what I do. I'm Uncle that's, Joe. I think I think that's a wonderful thing because it's not you're not on the fence about about your position. You're being Twitter's honest. grumpy enough as it is. They don't need one more grumpy Twitter. I I try and put the it light is. part into Twitter. Twitter's uh, Twitter's actually uh, toned down in terms of uh, community online writing communities. Facebook is pretty miserable. <laughs> There's a oh, lot. Yeah, it's like you look. I, I I say to myself, what would Twitter be like right now if there wasn't Donald Trump? Yeah. But we don't <laughs> want to go down the Donald Trump rabbit hole. But I'm just yeah. saying, the amount of the amount of electronic data. That yeah. these supercomputers around the world are dealing, you know, it's amazing. It's amazing. So in terms of so in terms of using Twitter, you've used it more as a platform to help lift other people up, um, be positive, be a positive influence. Have you seen uh, a good turnaround though in terms of like uh, the interaction that you get with other people? Like, have you made a lot of good connections on Twitter? Absolutely. Um, I've got. Uh, some amazing followers. Uh, very early in the Uncle Joe GTA Twitter account, um, one of my favorite radio stations in the universe is Q107 here in Toronto, and the Morning Crew uh, all follow Uncle Joe. Um, That's awesome. And, and uh, <laughs> um, it's uh, I'm a huge rock and roll music fan. Music is a huge part of my life, um, as well as writing, and I've gone from well a few hundred followers to just over 7400 uh in a couple of years and yeah. noticed a huge increase um i joined a couple of writing forms i'm also a member of the crime writers association of canada and okay. uh also is that like an actual place you guys meet that's an online community it's no it's an actual uh physical group uh we uh have um book signing events, uh, panel discussions. Wow. Uh, it's, uh, can it's countrywide. We have branches in the West coast out in BC, central Canada, East coast, um, all over. We have some phenomenal talent up here. Wow. We just don't play Are... hockey and, uh, <laughs> Horton. hang out with moose. <laughs> But my, there, there could be there could be some criminal moose out there, you know. Criminal moose, that's be, it, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, Bullwinkle's yeah. alter ego. Um, Absolutely. So you get out in the community and you go do book signings and that kind of thing. Absolutely. How have you found that work in terms of? Because I've talked to some other authors as well, and at first, self publishing it feels like everything is here, like behind the computer. Like, let me get all that done. What have you seen work for you best? It's intimidating as yeah. hell. Um, it but it's, it's amazing seeing... Uh, for, this wasn't actually a book signing. This was uh, just a regular day going to my bank. Uh -huh. And I had to make a deposit. And mm -hmm. this was right around Christmas. And one of the, the two tellers that I normally see, I just, you know, I brought a couple of books and wanted to give them a little gift because it's Christmas time. Hand the one teller. And then the other teller, I said, do you, are you a reader? 
oh, huge reader. Yeah, I was at the bank, just right around Christmas time, and mm -hmm. spoke to one of my tellers, and I said, you know, I wrote a book. I wrote this thing, White or Black and Gray, in the files of the BAU. And uh, I said, she almost burst out into tears. And I, 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 what have I done to this woman? And yeah. she, she was shaking, and she goes, oh my God, you wrote this? She grabs a pen, she goes, you've got to sign this for me. Well, first of all, it was my first autograph. Oh, wow. And because I write under a pen name, I'd never signed Joseph Mellish before. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I had to think in my head, I had to actually look at the cover to see how you spell Joseph, because again, <laughs> I said that a couple of times. Well, so I sign it quickly, and just, that was my first huge fan experience and yeah. it it's in it it's a blessing to see the joy in somebody's face that you bring but it's also intimidating as hell yeah it is you know having like i'm like wow i did that to you just by like oh forget about it you know? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make any it doesn't make any sense to us right we're just like i'm just, I, i'm a, a weirdo like you have no idea. I, I, I'm just a guy that makes up shit and I yeah. put it on paper. And she was freaking out. Yeah, I think I think being so involved in a writing community too, though, like where everyone around you is a writer, not being able to connect with fans is so important because we forget how difficult it is to actually tell a, a good story. Absolutely. And it's Absolutely. it's such an amazing art form telling an, a compelling story. They can either bring you to tears, bring you to laughter, or give you this sense of, holy crap, you just blew my mind all over the freaking walls. And, and this is the other thing. It's like our time is, so, we have so little time. And the fact that people, when you have readers who are willing to invest their free time, which is not free. Right. Your free time is your most expensive time. Yeah. They're willing to spend that time reading my book. Wow. I'm like, I'm, I'm floored and honored. I'm just a schmuck that put it on a paper, but you're, <laughs> you guys are the stars you're reading. Like, you know, that's the amazing part. It is right. And it, with, with that too, I always ask this question, what is it that you want people to get from your books? Like what's the legacy? If, if a hundred years from now, uh, the only thing left of you was, was white, black or gray or white or black gray. What would you want people to understand about, about, well, Joseph Malish, but, you and what you're writing like what would you want them to get from it oh, oh wow um probably wow something uh, <laughs> basically uh, that my worlds are very different from any other book i've ever read and a few of my reviews have said that and that really hit home with me my world is my world and mm. my characters. Uh, the one thing I'm very blessed with, I write, I'm very blessed. A lot of my followers and readers have said that my dialogue is, inc I, I, I hate, they say my dialogue is incredible. Apparently it's incredible. Um, and I, I, I'm very for it because I, I do a lot of talking to myself, especially when I'm writing. Uh -huh. When you're writing dialogue, I talk as if I'm talking to the uh, as one of the characters. Right. And if if you, you know, there's people people talk like they normally talk. And if you read so many books written by, you know, some some even of the greatest authors, you listen to their dialogue and it's like, what? Yeah. Um, you know, and there has to be lingo. There has to be slang. Not everybody talks the same. Uh, you know, there's southern accents, and I love putting accents. You know, and and even and it's tough sometimes typing typing a word in act in an accent. Yeah. Um, but dialogue driven drama. Put y's, extra R's and stuff like that. And oh yeah, uh, in in w. white or black in in white or black gray. Uh, one of the chapters, well, several of the chapters is in Alabama and mm -hmm. one of there's, there's a judge and of course, oh, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of Southern drawl and oh, yeah. also characters, um, 
you know, there's one, one of the characters is talking about going bass fishing and he talks about crankbait. It's important, it's important to include all the different accents and, and uh, as much as possible in our dialogue, right? Absolutely. It, that, that's what gives your, that's what gives you, helps to give your characters depth and people can relate to characters that feel real. Yeah. So that's what you want to leave for, for people is, is the, the sense of connecting to authentic humans. Exactly. You know, it, it's just like, you know, villains can't just be a guy with a wiry mustache and a black hat. <laughs> villains have to, um, you know, make your screen, make your skin crawl. Yeah. You know, make make you like, oh my god, ugh, he, ugh. but at the same time, I love writing a villain, uh, the backstory for a villain that makes people think, wow, I can understand why he did that. And yeah. in white or black gray, a lot of people have said, you know, as evil, twisted, and really messed up your guy was i kind of felt bad for him and like that's the highest praise in the world you can get as a crime writer yeah, yeah where you feel like you have to question your own morals for a second like am i really siding with this hold on a second yeah, yeah. It, it does it gives yeah. you that sense of, holy crap and that all yeah part of part of one of the reasons why it was so i'm like there was a a gap between the final draft and actually publishing I hit this weird crisis in my mind. What if by releasing this story and what this villain does to his victims, you know, somebody does it in real, yeah. like it inspires like, somebody to do yeah. this. I'm like, oh my God, like that would be, you know, that would be the absolute death of me, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, and any creator's life, for that yeah. matter, when you create something and so and it, you know, takes somebody who's already twisted and perverted, mm -hmm. just gives them that. Wow, like something like that happened um, that, based off of a character would be would be terrifying. That's, that's not the kind of legacy we want to leave. Obviously. Absolutely not. We want in a we positive want, way. We, we want to inspire thought, not actions. Right. <laughs> we, I, I think, I think too, it's like, it sounds like you want to inspire um, or help people connect with what's going on inside people's heads. So there's not such a disconnect of, because we, there, and, and we talked about depression before, but there's this disconnect with people who, um, in mental illness, that it's just like we're weirdos, they don't understand it. And it's just because there's not a perspective that they can they can understand. They don't understand, they, they don't have. Exactly. And here, here's the thing. We all, I don't care. Everybody if you have a pulse, you've got mental illness. You know, there is you know yeah. That's the that's the way to end the stigma. You cannot show me or one person who doesn't have issues. One right. family that, you know, doesn't have some dysfunctionality in their family. It's right. a way of life. If, you know, we talk about the peaks and valleys, you know, it's embrace our, Im I tried normal once and it was the worst 15 seconds of my life. That's you right. You know, just embrace who you are and let's not sweat it so much. Just embrace who you are. Yeah, and it's the imperfections that make us special. It's not it's our vulnerabilities that make us strong. It's not our our immediate strength. That I heard this yesterday, but it's like if you've ever tried to stab water, it's impossible. The water just moves around you, but the water will eventually destroy the knife. You know Absolutely. what I mean? Like yep. if you're just you have to be so allow that weakness to become your strength. And that's what being vulnerable and being imperfect is. And none not a single one of us it's ever walked the earth is perfect. No, no, no. And it, it perfect. I believe it's the sign. It's a sign in Google's head office. Don't like done is better than perfect. You yeah. know, it, you can always, we're always in the motion of improving. If you have a pulse, you can always improve. Yeah. And if you were perfect, what would be the point of doing anything? Right. 
you have you would have had experienced everything you would have gone down every infinite branch there is to go down yeah there, there would be no there would be no reason for waking up in the morning if your life was perfect right yeah it takes away the excitement of the story there's no discovery anymore exactly and that's what makes characters great in book yeah it's important to have those characters that we can relate to the Abs- i mean Abs- the greatest heroes have the greatest struggles right absolutely Joseph, it's been uh, a pleasure getting to talk to you, man. It's it's been really really cool getting to relate to you about your book and uh, and white, black, gray, right? Or white or black? Gray. White or black, gray. First in the series from the files of the BAU. First in the series, and it's out, out now. It's available on Amazon. Amazon, and it will be available uh, shortly on my website, uh, josephmellish.com. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, you gotta love the big Amazon. You know, you that's right. Click, <laughs> you know, they've got the—they're like a shipping machine. They are. You know, you want something, anything, you can get it. Anything, yeah. And it's made it so great for us as authors to oh. have a platform like that. Print on, print on demand, man. Like it's, I, it's a beautiful thing, right? Oh, we're saving trees. They only yeah. print when they need it, and the process is amazing. Yeah, it's you know, incredible. One, one minute it it's just a bunch of, you know, digital things in cyberspace and then you get this hard copy to hold on to and a book is amazing. Ebooks are awesome, but that smell and yeah. that feel, you know, yeah. of a book in your hands is like it's a little bit of heaven. It's a fully realized brain baby. Absolutely. Can, absolutely. Awesome. Well, Joseph, thank you again so much. I really do appreciate it. Everyone go check out white or black gray um available on amazon now joseph thank you so much sir thanks matt it's been a pleasure awesome man we'll talk to you later brother talk to you later